Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Well. You may be seated. Praise God because Jesus is Lord, is he not? Amen. Hallelujah. Good to see you this morning. For those of you who are here, those of you who are not traveling, let's, let's pray for those who are taking this long weekend off. That as they go, that they receive God's divine protection. Amen. 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 Praise God. Okay. Um, questions from anyone? Okay. Got one hand over there. And one hand over there. We've got two. Let's, if you're first, go ahead. Michelle, you're first, I think. Okay. Um. Good morning. Good morning. Last week, it was a mention about uh, when you get married and hyphenating your your last name with keeping your maiden name and mm -hmm. then hyphenating to your husband's name. I shared that with a few of my friends, and they had responses that I could not really give answer for. So I was hoping that I can share the, their response and be able to take back to them um, a word. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, one said, I don't necessarily agree with hyphenating, that statement hyphenating your last name. And she said that because of my first adopted son, his last name had only been changed to Whitaker six months prior to my marriage. And he didn't want to be the only Whitaker in the household. I had no problem dropping the Whitaker for myself, but when you are dealing with a subject as sensitive as the adoption of an older child, things may be a little different. The other lady, uh, very renowned in the music industry, was an only child, and she said, I just like to say respectfully, I took my husband's name. I didn't look at it as him giving me his name. I am my father's only child. I am preserving my family born name by hyphenating, and lastly, professionally, I was known as Oliver and decided not to completely change my identity. Just my reasons for hyphenating. The worst part is people not knowing to look me up under my maiden name um, because of her career in the past. So I was unable to, to really give them a response, and I just thought maybe I could share that and be able to uh, deliver word back to them. Okay, hyphenated names. Question to all of you. Why would you want, apart from what she just mentioned, hyphenate your name? Why, apart from the ones that she gave that she wanted to retain the family name, right? First lady adopted her son right. six months before marriage, right. and he would have been the only one with her maiden name. Mm -hmm. The second lady, uh, career-wise, was a professional singer in a group that was a well-known back in the 80s and early 90s, and she's an only child, so she said she wanted to preserve her father's, her father's name. name. Let me just say something off the record here for you which we're not going to give you any scripture for that. I believe if you're going to get married, which is okay, if you can handle it. If you do not have enough respect for the name that you're getting, your husband's name, don't get married. Names, scripturally, changes the, the character of the person. Change of name is a change of character. Let's give you one example of the bad. I think it's in Genesis 32, I believe, when um, Jacob's name was changed, right? From Jacob, which means what? Supplanter, to Israel, meaning a prince of God. All through scripture, whenever God changed his name, it was always for something better. I do believe marriage is one of those things. If you do not have any respect or honor for the person that you're marrying and their name, don't get married. Because hyphenated name, if you look up that whole phraseology, it means a separation and division. That's what it means. It means separation or division. It means that you're trying to 
isolate something that should be either diminished or do away with in order to make something better. Even Jesus Christ gives us a new name. That is why even being saved, he first, what, what was the first thing he did? He gives us what? His name. He says, baptism must be done in the, no other name, he says. Did you get that? He says, salvation is in no other name, but in the name of who? Jesus. Jesus. So I believe the person who hyphenates their name are dabbling with the curse. Because I'm not saying that your family is cursed. I'm just saying that is what is expected for you to do. Take that name that you're married to and be governed by that name and not to hyphenate it. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures that may, may help you out as well. Now, whenever you're in a family, if you are a blended family and you're getting married to someone who have children, which I do believe, blended family, I mean, that's a trip here, I tell you. The children do not have the right to dictate the, the policies that governs the relationship. I believe if you're gonna get married and you're already gonna get, you're gonna get married to someone who has a, a child or children, they need to understand that they're gonna take the name of the person that you're marrying to. Now, you can't force them to do this. However, in a lot of cases where I see this, these children, they have no say within the matter. Some, in some cases they do. If it's an older child and they want to maintain the name of their previous father or mother, they have the right because they're old enough to do that. But as children, we need to make sure that that name is changed to the person that you're married to because it, it garners respect and honor. Professionally, you are putting your profession above your marriage. You're putting your profession above your marriage. And you can't put your profession above your marriage because that is the name that you are going to be governed by. That's the name that Jesus recognized, and I hope you know that. He doesn't recognize any other name other than the one that you're married to. Now, I understand that there are controversy of this in our society, but you see, I'm not speaking to people in the world. Amen, Pastor. I'm not talking to people in the world. I'm talking to people in the church. The people in the world can do whatever they want to do. But however, if you want to do correctly, that's what you need to do. No family member, no mother, no father have the right to dictate to you that you need to allow that. You're allowing the legal curse upon your life. Couple of scriptures. It may not 100% relate to it, but let me show you. I think I'm in John. Let me turn to Luke. Now, In Luke 1, now you know about Elizabeth and Zacharias, right? Who are going to be a John, right? Now, let me spare some of the time of reading all through all this. And uh, you know that Zacharias, Zacharias was made dumb. In other words, he could not speak until the time that the child was born, right? Right. Now, in verse... Um, 58, he says what? And her neighbor and her cousin, or kinfolks, who wants to help me read? Hear how the Lord hath what? Showed great, great mercy upon her. Go ahead. And they rejoiced with her. Okay. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they call him Zacharias after the name of his father. You get that now? The one of, uh, now, Zacharias is a priest, right? And this family name Zacharias has been gone from generation to generation. So then it's obvious then that 
John's name would be Zacharias after the father, right? Yes? Next verse says what? And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. Mm -hmm. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. Notice not. The father is not taking any tips from the mother. Because remember now, not only was Jack Zacharias, um, what? Dumb, but he was also deaf. Could not hear. Okay. And he asked for a writing table and wrote saying, his name is John. Now, and they marveled all. Which now, you see now, change of what? Name, change of character. Always in scripture. In this case, God did that and is showing us the importance of that. Now, if we can take a tip from God's word, we are densed. Okay? We cannot follow the world system. The world will always do this so as to maintain their prestige, their importance, their whatever. However, it is the fact that we are then going to bring a curse upon our life when we don't do that. Plus, the added disrespect and dishonor. It always carries through that. Always. Now, there are other scriptures I can use. I don't want to take a question with this one. All the time, just one question. And the question, the answer from you, a response from you about that. Now, okay, let me just finish this and I'll take that one. Jesus, remember that? His name would, should be called what? Yeshua. Now, what it say? We understand that's what his name, the, the Hebrew name. If it was going to be understood that Joseph was his father, because that's what they're always saying, then his name should be what? Yosef, which is Joseph. What his name should be? Yosef or Joseph. But he wasn't called what? Joseph. The angels are what? His name. His name. Emmanuel, which we gather, but his name is Jesus. Yes. And that's why the name is given to us for baptism. Because you say when we are baptized, we are taken out of what? Darkness into what? Light. Light. We're taken from cursed to blessing and righteousness. And that's why baptism is so important, the proper way. Okay, not follow us in the Holy Ghost. Okay, question or response? Okay, is it along this line? Okay. Are we help, are, am I helping you here? So then, tell your friend, she can do whatever she wants to do if she's in the world. <laughs> but in the body of Christ, this is what God expects. And no one in the world should try to convince you otherwise as a believer because you know the right way. They do not set the boundaries. They do not set the guideline. It's not about their name or their family name. It's about the right thing. Okay, go ahead, my sis. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning. I have one statement and three questions. Oh, give me them, them one at a time. I'm sorry? Give me the questions one at a time. Okay. Okay. Um, my statement is that I believe 100% in tithe and offering, and mm -hmm. my three questions is in reference to tithes and offering. Okay. My first question is where in the New Testament does it reference tithes and offering? Let me give you in in um, it's the Second Corinthians. I'm giving the offering piece. Second Corinthians nine. Now, before I, I read this, it should be understood. Uh, uh, Find the scripture, Elder Bernie, about you, you give tithe of. Uh, and I know it's the Old Testament. You give Tyler all these things, okay. and these things you ought to do. Right. Now, in, uh, in, in tithes and offering, it was expected 
that all Israel tithe. Tithing in the New Testament was not a great issue. It was the offering piece that was an issue. The Old Testament, I think, is in the Gospel. Jesus talks about it. He said, you give tithe. Go ahead. It's, uh, it's Luke 11. Luke 11. 42. Okay. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue, mm -hmm. and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. Mm -hmm. These ought ye to have done, mm -hmm. and not to leave the other undone. Okay, so they were doing it. So then there will be no need to reinvent the wheel concerning tithe in the New Testament, because they were doing it. Okay. Um, we see the situation over there in the book of Acts with Ananias and Sapphira. They were what? Tithes and offering. It was it in, in, the, uh, in Acts 6. It starts in Acts 5. Okay. Conclusion, Acts. Go ahead. Acts 5, 1. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, mm -hmm. his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, which part did they bring? The tithe. Which part they did not bring? The offering. There it is in the New Testament. Go ahead and read. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Which means he died, all right? Now, his wife the same way. Now, the part that he kept back was the offering like most people do today. They may tithe or what they call tithe, whether it be 10%, 8%, or 12, 20% or whatever, but tithe is always 10%. But they say they do not give offering. That means they're keeping by that part. So then God is saying, you're lying to me. Say you're tithing and you're giving offering. Because you're going to stay here, he says, you're under a curse when you do that. So that's the New Testament scripture for that, Ananias and Sapphira. Now, so then they were tithing. Well, they never give offering, and that's why we grossly violate God's word when we do not give offering. That's why when Paul picks us up over here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 and 9, he says here, and this is talking about the, the sowing of the offering now, or it could be also the, the first fruit offering. In verse number 6, he says, 9 verse 6, he says, but this I say, he which what? Second Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, he which what? So sparingly. So sparingly which is the which is same as to give. Sparingly shall what? Shall what? Sparingly. Okay, okay one reader, go ahead and read from it. And he which soweth bountifully shall also what? Okay. Go ahead, Elder. Um, Verse 7. Every man, according as he had purposed in his heart, what? So let him give. Which is what the offering is. Thank you. Offering is not the same as tithe. What you have purposed in your heart, or as God has blessed you. 
which means then your giving can be more than the tithe. But in the case of Ananias, just think, they sold all this stuff, they're gonna give the tithe, but then go, they don't need the offering. We just act like we're not, like, like we're giving the offering, but they just tithe. And this is where a lot of people make big, 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 big mistake because in a lot of cases, the adversary don't care if you only give tithe as long as you don't give offering because you see, the blessings come where? On the offering and not the tithe. So he goes on and he says what? Every man, mm -hmm. according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now, and you, and you quote the Old Testament scripture over here, a promise from verse nine down. But we don't have to go into that, you can read the rest. Because he's quoting something. Am I helping you out? Yes, sir. Okay, the second question. Second question is, does the, anywhere in the New Testament, does it reference 10% of your income or 30, 60, 90 of your offering? Well, you know, see, you missed that teaching completely. <laughs> no, I think what you said, but I just want to make sure I understood, is that because it's in the Old Testament, it just, it's not repeating itself. There'd be no need if they were doing it. Okay. The only time you find that it is, it's repetitious is because they're not doing it and you're trying to enforce a new covenant blessing that was carried over from the old one. Okay. okay. Yes. My third question is, what is the purpose other than maybe for tax purposes that we have to put our name and the amount that we're giving um, on an envelope? It is done for our purpose, so that we may give you on the, I think Ella Burner put that together for us, proper accounting of what you have given, so if you want to file it for taxes to get a deduction from it, you can, but you don't have to if you don't want to. But the list charitable given, how much you have given. And because we told you how much you have given for the entire year, you can, use that and they can give you a reduction from it. So to make sure that I understand, you don't have to put your name on the envelope if you choose not to. If you choose not to, but then it's for our sake that you do. So that we can properly account to you how much money you gave. It's not for the government's purposes, for your purpose. Are you following me? So if you, at the end of the year, say, well, uh, I gave this money, I gave that much money, uh, but I don't have any record or anything for it, we can then give you that record so that you can use it if you want to. Am I saying this thing correct? Yeah, go ahead. Are you gonna tag onto this? Okay, what are you gonna say? Uh, Mike? I think it's also the case that for anyone who gives and they record their name, then that means that they're also entitled to a contribution statement and an expenditure for how the church has managed those funds. If we don't have your name recorded in the software, then we cannot accurately provide you with an expenditure and account to the person how the ministry has spent the funds over the course of the year. Right, so that's what all that's for. So we want to do things uh, upfront, forthright, when it comes to your donation, your giving, so that you know what we're using it for. Any other question? Yes. Piggybacking on what, what the discussion is, uh, right. does that uh, does wanting to know those questions take away from? being that cheer for giver. Not, you know, because for myself, I, I care not to know all that because I'm giving from my heart and I don't want anything to return. But what is expected from me according to the word. Let me, let me understand the question again, rephrase it. Okay. Um, um, does, does
does wanting to know all those questions that were asked, does that take away from the reason why you're given in the first place? No, it doesn't take away from the reason why you're given. You can choose, to, you know, we're going to provide it for you. You can do whatever you want to do with it. Right. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, because for myself, I, I care not to know all that because That's I'm right. given from the heart. And That's right. I, I, I know why I'm given, so I, it doesn't, I don't need to know all that. And that's the one that's okay with, the, with us if you don't. <laughs> but just in case you should ever want to, <laughs> no, it's there. <laughs> so yeah, because giving should be from the heart in the first place. And that's, and that's why as you give and you give from the heart, God recognized that above. He said, because I don't think we can keep track of every penny we give and we shouldn't. We shouldn't, okay? Yes. Just a quick question, just to... Um, clarify in my head. If um, in, Gal in Galatians 3, <clears throat> let's see, Galatians 3, chapter 13, mm -hmm. how are we subject to the curses of the law if Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law? Oh, it's simple, because you have put yourself back underneath it by not walking in the precepts. For instance, Christ has redeemed me from, let's say, um, sickness and death, right? Yes. But do you know you can put yourself back on that which Christ has redeemed you from? By simply what? Not believing what he did? But you don't believe that, that's exactly where you find yourself again. Because not believing it means what? You don't do it, you don't give any credence to it. It's not important to you. And that's all that has to happen. Because you receive, you, believe, you receive Christ because of what? Your belief and your faith in Him. That's it. You can choose not to believe that and not be saved. So it's the same thing with the curse. You, Christ is not pronouncing that upon you afresh. You're just saying you have Put that word of faith aside and you have done what you want to do. Because under the new covenant, there are new articles of incorporation that binds us to him. And when you love God and his word, you would do it. But you don't love him and his word, or you have disdain for it, you will not do it. It's that simple. So you can do either what you want, but one is going to be what? Right? And one's going to be left. <laughs> no. <laughs> one's going to be right and one's going to be wrong. But that's what you do. Let me, let me tell you, are, you st are we still on the same frequency here? Okay, I, I think Reggie Hand was up first, I think. No, this one? Okay, Keena, go ahead. I believe in my statement, I said, the very first thing I said is that I believe 100% in tithe and offering. Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with a girlfriend last night, and I said to her, um, I love to give. I, I do. I love giving. I love making people happy mm -hmm. when I give. And I don't expect anything back. Mm -hmm. And I love giving to those, especially those that I can trust. I, I love doing that. And what I said to my girlfriend last night is, one thing that I need to work on is receiving because I'm not a very good, I don't do well with, um, with receiving. I, I just don't. I will tell, you know, managers, please don't get me a get birthday gift. Please don't give me a Christmas gift. I, I'm, I'm not good at that. And it's something that I think God wants us to, to yes. be good at, at receiving. He, he dealt with me years ago about that. When I was working and had my business and I would tithe, and um, he says to me back then, even when I came out of business, it was like two or so years after that, we didn't allow the church to bless us or to take monies from the church to help to support us. And God says, how do you expect the people to be blessed? He says, what you need to do is, he says, he does um, teach the gospel should live by it. So then he says, if you don't take 
from this to help in your daily uh, maintenance of life. He says, you're not allowing them to be blessed. And I go, no, God, I can't do that. I want them to be blessed. He says, no, this is what you need to do. So because up until two years, we didn't take a single thing. We lived off of the money that God has allowed us to accumulate. And he says, no, that's not right. So yes, you're right in that. So learning how to receive is very important because learning how to receive is also therapeutic for those who give. And you are then, by receiving, you're joining covenant with them in their ability to be blessed. And we don't want to deny them that privilege. Okay, are we, are we square with that? Okay, yes, Brother Reggie. Um, I have two questions, sir, but I'm not getting too much of your time. Um, no, this is God's time. Um, my, my grandmother, my grandmother had a brother, my Uncle Bill. My Uncle Bill only had a daughter. So the, the family name was Avery. So the name died with my Uncle Bill. My, my Aunt Gloria had a daughter. Her first name is Avery. Now, is that any kind of curse that comes there? Or is that, does that fall in line with what you were saying when you teach teaching about the name Avery? Or not the name Avery, but the, the name and keeping the last name. Or is that just something? As long as she's single. She, yeah, as long as she's single, she can hold that name. But as long as she's married, now that changes everything. Okay. She has that's to. She, that's probably the last name. Right. She has to take her husband's name. Okay. And, Avery, Avery Atkinson. So yeah. Her name would be Avery, whatever her husband's last name would be. Right. And drop that name. Yeah. Drop, name drop that family name. Name Jocelyn Atkinson. Right? Pardon me. Jocelyn Atkinson. Her first name is Avery. All right. Her last name is Atkinson, so she would have to drop the, the Atkinson. Atkinson. Yes. Right. Because like you. Your real name is Reginald Reed. No, your real name is Reggie. Reed is your family name. Oh, yes, sir. They didn't know whether it was going to be a Reggie or a Regina <laughs> at some point. <laughs> but they said they, they know it was going to be a Reed. <laughs> okay. So, Second question is about the necessity part of the tithe. Um, when when I when I get financially blessed, I feel this, I feel the necessity to give tithe and offering. Does that take away from my blessing? I feel like I have to do it. It's something that's part of me because I'm a Christian. You see, you're moving too fast in your talk, so I'm not getting everything you're saying. Oh, yes, sir. I need to talk fast. <laughs> That's because I'm a read, actually. And I'll talk fast. I'll talk all at one time, too. <laughs> yeah, it's quite actually funny. Um, the necessity part, um, I, when I'm financially blessed, I feel the need to get to the church. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel it's necessary. Does that take away from my blessing? No. If you're financially blessed, you have to first tithe from that blessing and give offering. Everything that we receive into our hands, my, my wife and I, we first give a tithe from it. Then we give an offering, everything. Sometimes people give us things. And when they give us things, we don't know what it cost. So we estimate a value and we pay tithe and offering from that. And that's the way to do it. Because the scripture says that we should form everything that comes to, into our hands. So we do that. It's not a legalistic thing, it's something to be right that we're doing. Are we helping you out here? Yes, sir. Yes? Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, I'm just piggybacking on what you just said. The way I hear it coming out, it's like God loves a chip and give. Mm -hmm. What he's saying, maybe that, that I heard is. When I get that financial blessing, it's almost like my mind is saying, oh, you have to give this. Not the way I look at it now. The way I look at it now, which tells me, wow, I want something so that I can give. Mm -hmm. You see, understand the difference? In other words, yeah. I'm looking forward to making this money so that I can give something on tithes and offering rather than getting a paycheck and saying, oh, I got to give this up as a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to have a lot of money because I want to give. I want to tithe. I want to bless the body of Christ. I want to bless people. I, don't, I never think about receiving anything. But because they, it's a law that's in operation, a law of reciprocity, it happens. 
it comes back to me in many ways, myriads of ways, ways that I can't even imagine. But he did say, when in the law is what? He that soweth what? Sparingly. So that means then, I realize then, if I give money, then God can of course what? Money to come back to me. If I give what? Shoes, God's going to cause what? Shoes and galore to come back to me. <laughs> you know, and I experienced that. I mean, literally. Because several years ago, when R.W. Schambach came to Greensboro, maybe some of you don't remember that. And I think it was in the 80s. And we went to one of, the, one of those meetings. And we did not have, because we had just opened up the business, we had spent most of our money in setting up the business and purchasing um, things for the store and jewelry and stuff like this. So when we went to this meeting, we, we wanted to give a good offering, but we didn't really have a lot of funds on hand at that time. And my wife was wearing a watch. It was a gold watch we had given to her. I was wearing one. It was a gold watch. And what we did was we pulled it off and we put it in the offering plate. It, it costs money, but then we're still on a watch. I know what happens. In the next three years, we start receiving watches. <laughs> no kidding. And I can point it out to you in different ways, but I'm not going to because I don't want you to get a little uh, dizzy. But we receive watches, expensive watches. You know, people just say, whatever you can do with this and stuff like this. And then my Latin fast mind says, yeah, that's because that's what you gave. <laughs> okay, it was coming back to me. I hadn't thought anything about it. I just wanted to give something. And we didn't have any cash, but we just, you know, put those watches in there. It's because I don't think when I'm giving away stuff, what the thing costs. I just want to bless people. And I want them to know that the blessing that they get is something substantial. As you see, I don't want to give away things that don't cost me anything. So Paul says, I will not offer to God anything that does not cost me something. So sometimes we want to give away stuff that's all broken down and, you know, we don't want it no more. No, 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 no. I want to give away nice things. Because when God blesses me, he blesses me with nice things. So it's more blessed to, it's blessed to receive, but it's more blessed to, so I look forward to what? Giving more than receiving, but the law of reciprocity works where what I get, but I don't give in order to get. I give because I love giving and I love the Lord. Yes. glad you brought this conversation it's happening because I've been reading Hebrews and so from my understanding Jesus is the order of Melchizedek from the old covenant so with tithe I'm, I'm not really seeing in the New Testament any clear line of the tenth so my question is where does the percentage of what you give come in because every time I look for it I see offering and people giving out of their hearts such as the lady who gave all that she had the widow, I believe it was. So where does the percentage, because the tithe was given to the Levite, there are no Levites here today, no priest. No, that's a different tithe, because you said they were under five tithes back then. Five. Not one, five. When the tithe went to the Levites, it was five. But let me show you. Remember, maybe you can find over in Genesis for me, when uh, uh, Jacob was running from his family and he came to the place that he, the rock that he called Bethel and he says all that God gives me I will what? Give a tenth. That's where it was established in that, in that verse. Yeah, in, in Genesis 28 In verse, if we start reading from verse 20. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me mm -hmm. and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat 
and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. Mm -hmm. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So he's talking about the tithe. See, he already knew that. But what he was saying was he was making a vow that no matter what the blessings look like, no matter how much it is, all that God give me, 10% belongs to God in tithe. So there's the tenth. Okay. It shows up other places, but go ahead. From that scripture or any other scripture, is there any indication that that carries over into the new covenant as that was Old Testament? Yeah, but, yeah because tithe means a tenth. God has prospered a lot of us in so many different ways, but we don't even think about giving God tithes and offering. Or if we barely make the tithe, we don't think about giving him offering, just give him a dollar. Let me see you go to one of your fine restaurants today, and, they, and your check comes to $150. And you, don't, and you don't leave them a tip of at least 15%. You'd be embarrassed to do it, right? Not to, right? Yes. Well, none of us are embarrassed when it comes to God, when it, because God says what? We are robbers. In the church, we got what? Robber in the church. Can you think about it? You come to the church and rob from God. <laughs> That's what he says. I didn't say it, so don't look at me. I'm just telling you what he says. Don't shoot the messenger. I may shoot back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes. Am I helping you, my sister? No, let me get, before I go to the next one. Am I helping you? No, speak up if I'm not. No, we want to get this cleared up as much as we can. Not completely, but okay. I, can we come back to it another time? I, not, not completely. <laughs> um, I, I need, I need to hear where you are still foggy. I'm still foggy where I, you know. So, if Jesus has redeemed us from it, just like being saved, it's done. Um, then it should be done. And it's done. And it's done. Right. So, because I may not, I may falter in something, does that mean it's still not done? I mean, I would think that that still holds true, and I need to get back, but it's still done. I'm going to show you some of it if I can find it in Galatians. What does it say? Well, it talks about uh, redemption from the law being um, receiving the adoption of sons, but then in verse 8. No, it talks about falling from grace. Okay. Galatians 5.4, is that it? Let me turn to it. Galatians 5.4, read what this says. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Mm -hmm. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Yeah. Uh, so then he's saying then what? What Christ has enforced in his word, and what he's saying, is not having an effect on your life. So because what? If you're going back to operate as if you don't know it, he says what you have. He's not saying that he has taken grace from you. He says you have fallen from it. Which means what? You have 
enforce something that you have already been redeemed from by simply not obeying the word or walking in the truth of his word. A lot of the people will be blessed, but that person will not be. A lot of people will receive favor from God, but you, that person, will not receive that favor. He says, well, you have fallen from grace. He didn't say God put you down. He says, you have fallen. He didn't say that he has not redeemed you. He says, what? You have chosen to go back upon that redemption. In Hebrews 6, Um, he speaks about the doctrine of baptism and laying on of hands, right? In, in verse 1 and 2. In verse um, 3, he says what? And this will do if God permit, right? Verse 4 says what? For it is impossible for those who are what? Once enlightened and have what? Tasted of the heavenly gift and were made what? Partakers of the Holy Ghost and have what? Tasted of what? The good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall what? Fall away to renew them again to repentance seeing they have what? To themselves. To themselves, not blanketly or to everyone. To that person. To themselves what? Crucify to themselves right. the Son of God afresh mm -hmm. and put him to an open shame. Right. That's what's happening. To themselves. So that means if you do not walk in this, that's what you're doing. And that's not just in tithe, it's with anything else that you have chosen to stand against or not to accept as the truth of God's word, or understand the relevance of it today under the new covenant, a better covenant. You see, the thing about it is, a lot of the old covenants, if you didn't do some of these things, they will hang you up and throw you out, or excommunicate you from the church and all that type of stuff. Under the new covenant, God says what? It is a better covenant that he has established on better promises. So God says what? You can do it if you don't want to. However, there's no reward for you in this life or the life to come. When we read Revelation, he says what? He will uh, uh, see. I am wanting all of these things to work for me. I don't want to do anything that causes it not to work. Um, let me find it here. He talks about reward as according to our works. Revelation, somewhere down to 20, 21. Uh, Revelation 20, huh? 2012. 2012. Okay. What does it say? And behold, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Right, so then he's talking about what? Reward us according to what works? Work of faith, works of giving? Yes? That means what? God's gonna reward us for this as well. Are you understanding that? Now, let me give you something here that maybe you haven't thought about. Remember when God sent Peter down to Cornelius' house? And he says what? Your giving has come up before me what? Yes, he did not say stive. 
He says what? Why not? Cornelius was a Gentile. He didn't know or accept, maybe I want to say he didn't even know about tithing. He was a Gentile. But his giving was so extensive. Are you understand what I'm trying to say? His giving, his offering was so extensive that we could say that it superseded anyone giving tithe. But he was a Gentile, and the Gentiles were not under any of those promises from God, according to Colossians and Hebrews, because the Gentiles were not under any covenant from God. They were a law unto themselves. They did whatever they wanted to do. But this man believed God so much so that his giving was so extensive that God wanted to recognize him. And so we could say, well, then, his offering, because he didn't know anything about tithing, whether he was a Gentile. But today, as a believer, you are not what? Jew or Gentile, you are what? The church of believe in God. And God expects for you to support the thing that will turn around and in return support you. He expects that from you. Okay. We can just leave that right there and then we can maybe come back to it later. Yeah, go ahead, next. Well, my, my question goes back to what Brother Reggie asked. <clears throat> when he said, um, will I be cursed? Um, I guess, what does it mean to give out a necessity? To give out of necessity? Yeah. Because she'll tell yourself that either I need it or I can't afford it to give. Because other people go, I can't afford to tie, I got bills to pay. Or, uh, if they don't say that, they go, I don't believe in tithing anyhow. You know, why should I give God my money? Okay, go and tell the government that. Why do you give them the taxes? Or, well, they suppose, you're supposed to give it. Or you do. I don't want to raise up a, raise sand right here now. <laughs> okay. But there's nothing in the Constitution that talks about you paying taxes. Okay, let's, let's forget I even said it. <laughs> let's forget about how I even said it. For those people who are listening, let's forget I even said it. Well, this is where the curse comes in, in Malachi. It's in the Old Testament that, that scripture they, they're going to bring over. Remember now. When Malachi was written, there was around 400 years, we could say, sabbatical to the Word of God, where no Word of God came to the people because the people were in such rebellion and such disarray and disobedience that there was no Word coming. The only Word they heard was when the angel came and talked about the birth of Jesus Christ, or the angel came and talked to Zacharias. That was the first Word for like 400 years. Okay? Now, um, <clears throat> And uh, okay, in Malachi three verse nine, but eight and nine, he says, "What will a man rob God? Mm -hmm. Yet ye have robbed me. Mm -hmm. But ye say." Wherein have we robbed thee? There were, because what? They couldn't, at this point, during this 400 year, where they didn't have in the word of God, they weren't being made proficient in tithes and offering. So God is trying to get the people to come back to him. And in coming back to him, they're gonna ask, where shall we return? And God didn't say, I need for you to go and fast 30 days, did he? Did he? Did he say, I need for you to show me how spiritual you are by coming to church regularly? Is that what he said? Yeah. He talked about the thing that God says you cannot rob God and mammon. So then they're using those two in the same phrase. What I mean? So what I'm gonna rob God. He says what? In ties. And offerings. and offerings. 
Then he says what? Ye are cursed with a curse. There you are. So then he says what? When you don't tithe and give offering, you are what? Operating under a curse. Now, this doesn't change within the new covenant. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse, which means what? Which means what? The curse will have no effect upon you, even though the curse still exists. Because what? I have taken care of it for you. But now, Christ removed that from us. He's not saying the curse that Christ removed from you, you're going to go back under. That's one of the redeemed, which is, a, we could say, a blanket, comprehensive thing. He says, now you have put yourself under now a new curse. Because you are, you know, we, we did a teaching some time ago, and it's called this what? God put something together, and you're trying to put it apart, it's called deconstructionism. So now you're trying to construct a life and a lifestyle outside of that which God gives to justify your own belief and your own persuasion. And that's why in Hebrew says what? You are now fallen from the grace of God. You didn't, see, you don't fall up. You fall down. <laughs> So if you fall down, now you put yourself back under what? A curse, because now you're not listening to God, you're listening to what? The devil. You're not listening to God's command, you're listening to what? The adversary's command. Understand, the devil don't want you to give God anything. Did you know that? Did you know that? Yes. Why give God anything? Because he does not want to tie you to the covenant of blessing that God has for you. Now, a lot of people in the world can get away with that because they don't know it. So a lot of things can happen in their life. That's not good. And they don't even know to make, uh, to, to say, well then, it's because of this why this is happening. They can't make the contact. But I guarantee you, people in the church who have heard this, who knows about it, when things are happening, they're going to start making the contact because the Holy Spirit is going to bring it to their mind. They're going to bring it to your mind. Say, it's because of this why this is happening. And it would be factual. The devil does not do that to you. He doesn't want you to do anything that's good on everything that is not good. Now, in saying this, I'm just telling you what the word says. Because I still gentleman who oh around maybe ten years ago wanted to start a ministry. You know, so I said, okay, now I can do to help you. So he started the ministry. And then he came back to me like two years later and he says, I can't get the people to tithes to support the ministry. And I says, oh, is that so? And I says, now, you weren't really a member here, but you came enough to hear some of the word. I says, were you a tither when you were coming here? He says, no. I says, there's your answer. Of course, he's, no, he's not in ministry anymore, but he's, but he's an elder, but he's not in ministry. I says, there is your answer. You don't do anything to support this ministry. And it's a growth and development. And, but now you want other people to support you. So there is your answer. <laughs> you see, be not Galatians, be not deceived. Self-deception is a powerful thing. Be not deceived whatsoever a man so that shall he also reap. It's also true. Do not perceive. Do not be deceived. Whatever man does not so, he will not receive. <laughs> that means what? Don't talk about when your ship comes in. 
you, you haven't seen one out, as a matter of fact, you don't even have a ship. <laughs> Self-perception is a very powerful thing. Did you know? Do you know what the powerful thing about self-deception is? Anybody here know? The consequences. That's a powerful thing about self-deception. The consequences. I, the devil used that on Adam and it worked and he used it on Eve and it worked. He, <laughs> he says, God doesn't know this, right? But you don't, but he does. That the day you what? He thereof, what's death? He's the same thing in Eve. God, the only reason why God did not deal with Adam in the same way he dealt with Eve because he did not enforce a consequence as to Adam not God in the Garden of Eden. There was no consequence. He just says, God, the Garden of Eden. There's no consequence. If you don't do it, it's going to happen. He didn't. And God did that purposefully. But with Adam, he says, what? Well, don't eat from this. Because if you dare you eat from it, you're going to die. Who do you think Eve learned that from? No. From Adam. She learned that from Adam. But she didn't believe what Adam said. How do we know that? Because she was the one that brought the fruit to Adam. And now Adam what? wanted to believe her because the scripture says they were there together. So she brought the food to Adam. And she can see, she persuaded Adam that this was not going to happen. Now you see, the, the word is filled with a lot of truth. Filled with a lot of truth. Yes. You got to follow up? Okay. So is it wrong to think that I have, I need to give my tithes and offerings so I won't be cursed? Or is that still giving cheerfully? Yeah, when you give your tithes and offering, you're affirming God's word that he has redeemed you from it. So then no evil shall come now, you need to place come now, you do that. So then the thing about it is you just make sure you don't pray about finances. Because God says what? He did that for you. You don't pray about the finances, just believe what you're doing is working. I had to learn that. Don't pray about the finances. No matter, just make sure you have good fiscal responsibility. That's what God expects us to do. And if we do that first things first, then the second thing will happen and the third thing will happen and God will bring myriads of funds in your life when you do it because you're operating under the obedience of God's word. Just don't pray, just thank him for all the blessings that's coming. Yeah. It's because if you don't, you will put yourself back under something that Christ already redeemed you from. Not the exact same thing, which means what well, your soul will never be cursed because you say, um, once you're saved, you are saved. But you, you may live a terrible life here and you will not get any reward in heaven from God for your giving. Because it's, the, the reward is not based upon you being saved because you did nothing to be saved. He did that for you. Your reward is based upon what you have done after you are saved. Are we understanding this? Yeah? Okay. Yes. I was listening to you saying that um, um, Jacob, when, when the tithe was established at Bethel. When the what now? The tithe, the tenth. The tenth. The tenth. Yeah, when it was established. And, and, and I was thinking that, you know, when the scripture says that Abraham tied to Melchizedek. Yes. Now, did that imply that he tied more than the tenth then? Because you said the tenth was established at Bethel. So I, I was just No, the scripture says he tied all that he had yeah. to Melchizedek, which means then, you know, sometimes people don't mind tithing $10. They don't mind tithing $20. 
But when your tithe comes to like $5,000, no, that's when it's really tough for you. <laughs> because the thing about I can't do this, God. And God is saying, what's the difference? How much more have you received that allows you to be able to tithe this amount? See that? And that's why he says, but he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. I am convinced the only reason why a lot of times people are not prospered the way they are, because God knows in your heart, the moment your time gets to a place where it almost becomes prohibitive, he, he, God we may not see it. <laughs> I really believe that. <laughs> <laughs> you see, because he knows more about you than even you know about yourself. Yes, yes. And he knows more about you than I do unless he tells me. And I believe that's the only reason. Okay. There's two questions for clarification to Christina's question. So is it true to say that Jesus redeemed us from the curse, mm -hmm. and, and that was for everyone. Everyone. However, our obedience is what enables us to access, yeah. because he redeemed us from the curse unto righteousness and all that righteousness offers. Yeah, he redeemed, so, right. he redeemed us unto. Right, not, unto not righteousness, from. right. So. The only way, though, that we can access that is through our obedience and the things that he has okay. stipulated here. Christ redeemed us from lying, right? Yes. Do you still lie? Do you still lie? Remember now, that was the clincher between Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> it's never about what? The money. He says, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? It's about the lie. It's not about the money. God don't need your money. He has more money than you can shake a stick at. He wants you to be honest and that is why you cannot get a Oh, what's the word? You cannot get an excellent spirit out of a corrupt heart. But when you have a corrupt, when you have a good heart, you will have an excellent spirit. Are you understanding that? So, you want to be excellent? Ask, pray the prayer that David prayed. Create within me a clean heart. Because from the clean heart, you get an excellent spirit, excellent in everything. Yes. Okay, second and last question is that now, since we've been redeemed unto righteousness, for in the, in the case of tithing, if someone decides that they're not going to tithe, does that actually place them on a frequency to receive things that they don't want. Because the tithe, that opens things up for you to receive from God all that God has to offer. But when one does not tithe, does that fall into the category of unintentional consequences, which means that a lot of things happen and you're receiving a lot of things that you actually don't want and don't want to happen, but you did not forecast that those things would occur. Right, and you feel condemnation. Because by the same way, that ties and offering what? Open what? Windows of heaven. Not tied and not given offering what? Close the windows to you. <laughs> if it opens up the window, it's also closed it. And again, like with Ananias and Sapphira, it's never about the money, it was about the fact that why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? So you can lie to me, but do you know that when you lie to me, you're lying to the Holy Ghost? Yeah. 
<laughs> because you see, your spirit needs to be free. You are not having a hang up within your spirit about anything. It needs to be free. Free to participate in the things of God. And everything that God made is good. Okay, another question. Yes, I got two more. I think, uh, go ahead, yes. Uh, I have asked this question kind of in response to the last question. How is it that we are blessed based upon our offering, but then you can be cursed or receive consequences based off not tithing? Because we're trying to live a duplicitous life. You see, the, the sitcom they had on years ago, maybe they still have it, I don't know. You got one life to live. <laughs> the point of that is what? You can't live a duplicitous life with God on the one. So you're either going to do it or not do it. You're either going to walk under the covenant, the new blessing, or you're going to put yourself back under what? Under the curse. No, it's not. Do you know that you can undo all that Christ has done? Not for the world, only for yourself. Because that's what I read to you. He said you are crucified to him afresh. That's what Hebrews says. All you got to do is what? Not believe. Now, Jesus puts it in graphic details in, in John, which maybe we are not to even look at it because you're going to think, well then, is this me? Well, I didn't. Christ says, well, you've done that. <laughs> so go ahead. Is it, is, it, is, it a, is it a follow up or is that a new question? It's a follow up. Okay, let's see the follow up. Let me take you. Right. So if you can be cursed for not giving tithes and offering, can you. Uh, are no, you Christ saying, didn't curse you. You. Curse me you, for not. Right, you do it yourself. Am I also going to be cursed for doing, for not doing other things of God? Or th so. Uh, the person who, let's say, steal and lie, even though they know they're not supposed to. He says what? You are operating under what? The curse. Notice now. God has already redeemed you from it, but you refuse to believe it, right? So now if you go and you rob the bank and you get caught and get thrown in jail for 900 years. <laughs> <laughs> You have put yourself under what? That curse of legalism. Now, you can still be in jail and still love God and still be saved. But it's still going to serve 900 years. <laughs> but Christ didn't do that to you. You did that to yourself. <laughs> That's what the curse is. Because the curse is nothing glamorous. I hope you know that. Nothing glamorous. It's all downhill. <laughs> so you have a lot of people who are in jail and that's the best place for them to be even though they're saved, you know that? Because if they come out, it ain't going to be pretty because they're going to have that freedom that's going to go to their head and it's not going to be pretty. Yes, go ahead. Um, maybe we need more clarity on the Old Testament scriptures that are foundational and that are I mean, they continue to be true, right? Mm -hmm. There are foundational scriptures in the Old Testament mm -hmm. that still applies to us today as a believer, despite the new covenant. I mean, mm -hmm. we quoted one yesterday in Women's Fellowship on Jeremiah. Um, in Jeremiah 29, 11, we shall have good success. So we can't pick and choose which part of the Old Testament we want to apply as a foundational type thing. Because mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 8, 18 says that it's, God that gives us the, the power, power to get wealth so we may establish his covenant, right? Right. That doesn't change because Jesus gave us new access through him unto righteousness. Right. Right. Am I thinking wrong? No, no, you're not that? thinking wrong. Let, let me give you a, a literal example. This land that we're on, 
Does anybody here know what was here first? No. I don't. That? This land. land. Okay. I don't know what was here first. Now, they have cleaned it off. The building that was here before this, I don't know. They put up this new building on it. Does the foundation change of the ground? Yeah. Still here. They just put a new building on it. We like the building. The foundation of things never change. Paul says we are built upon what? The foundation of Jesus Christ, the Lord. That never changes. He's the same what? Yesterday, today, forever. Those foundational truth don't change. No matter what kind of new building we put on it, we might clean it off and do this, that's still true. However, the building, it is what? Standing firm in place because of what? Foundation, because you cannot build a building on a vacant lot. You cannot just build a building in air, can you? The only person I knew who could cause the earth to stand in midair, it has nothing holding it down. There are no straps, no anything. Um, Santa says if you had, um, what is this, six billion worth of steel cable wrapped around the earth four, four or five times, that would be enough to hold it down. That's what they say, but that's not true. But when you look in, in um, space, the earth is there orbiting against nothing. Nothing is holding it down because God says what? Stay. He's the only one that can do that. So then, he says what? He's the foundation and the bedrock from which everything stands that never changes. We can construct whatever building we want to put in, whatever we want to do, we can do that. But the foundation remains the same. And the foundation will always dictate what you're able to build up. So the truth of God's word is forever. He, he chooses to bring one truth from over here, put it over here, and build on it. He has that prerogative, and he does that. And it's not for his sake, it's for our sake. It's for our sake. He wants us to what? Prosper and to be in health, even as our soul prospers. He wants us, us to be what? A co-labor with him in the ministry. Just think. If you are not supporting the ministry, if you are not giving tithes and offering, you are not a co-laborer with God. You're not a co-laborer of this ministry because we can't look to anything that you have put in here to cause this to happen. And just think, we can build this building, and we have. But just think, you say, well then, I'm gonna be the one who supports putting in the windows. And we've got, Ten windows in this auditorium, right? And you start off doing that. However, somewhere down the line, you decide that I'm not going to give any more money for the windows. So now we're going to have a building with only half windows. <laughs> You're going to have to what? Fulfill your obligation all the way around for this to be a complete project. Because you see, what most believers have a problem with, with God, they are not faithful. How? Not faithful in tithe, not faithful in offering. God cannot count on you. The church cannot count on you to finish anything that we have started. And that's the thing that most believers have a problem with, finishing that which they have started. And God says, the man who put his hand to the plow and look back or does not continue, he says what? I get no pleasure from that person. Finishing is vital. Finishing is vital. And believe me, you're not finished until you're dead. <laughs> I 
like the undertaker says, I'll be the last man to let you down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we talk about people, we're not going to fail you, we're not, you know, we're not going to let you down along the way. He said he'd be the last one to let you down. <laughs> yeah? Are we, so yes, you're right with that, the foundation stands. Yes? Go ahead. I have a Go ahead, sir. You have a question? Oh, I mean, oh, well. Uh, I was and thinking. It, it just all zoned out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you, made the, you had made the statement that uh, play, prison is the best place for a person to be. Feel okay. good? You, you said prison was the best place for a person to be? Prison. You said prison. Prison? Prison. Oh, for some people. Yes, sir. I was going to um, say that. Uh, Not everybody. For some people. <laughs> uh, David Berkowitz, the son, some, uh, the son of Sam. Right. He was a serial killer. He's actually a minister in prison now. He's a pastor. Uh, yeah. Serving life said. Yeah. Yeah. Not everybody. Don't get me wrong. There's some people because you can't trust everybody with freedom. Well, you know that? You can't trust everyone with freedom. It's not because they're not saved either. Because they don't know what to do with it. It's almost like ha having children and you don't know what it is to mother or father or a child or children. They're going to become delinquent. And that's because what? We have delinquent parents. That's why we have delinquent children. Okay, who else? About 15 minutes before we have to call it quits for the day. Question. Yes. I have a question. Um, I've often heard growing up that you can also tie your time. My question is if you're a part of, let's say, your job laid you off or you're out on medical leave or you're not working for whatever the reason. Is there any other way, if you don't have an income source, that you can tithe? Yeah, if you yeah, if you don't have income because you say you can only tithe from the income or from money you receive, whether it be from a job or whether it be a gift or whatever, that's what you tithe from. If you're not working then you can't but yeah, you tie your time because we're supposed to tithe our time. You know, God gave that to Israel in the Old Testament, did you know that? You know that? Do you know what tithing the time was, anyone? Anybody here know what tithing the time was? He gave them the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was the tithing of their time. Because the Sabbath amounts to 10% of the entire week. Yeah, yeah, of course. It was all day, it wasn't a part of the day. It was not a two hour service. It was when they went in the synagogue or the temple, it was an all-day affair. So then, if you don't have time for God, you're not even tithing your time. Which means, in a sense, you're robbing from God also. Did you know that? Because you need to tithe your time into the church. You need to get involved with doing that's how we go together, and we stay together, and we enrich together, we learn together, and we become a, a deeply well-knitted pack for the kingdom of God. I like to watch the National Geographic channel. I'm on the line, I'm on the prowl, I'm there looking for a luncheon. And we got a whole bunch of the city, um, the, the, wild, the wildebeest, each other for miles and miles, all year long, that's all it that you travels. And when they're looking for a luncheon, there are two things they look, they, they do, what? Anybody here know? What are the two things they do? Yes, Brother Dave? They look for the weakest and the youngest. Right. Or the old. Whereas 
there'd be nothing to get to them. Yeah, the first one is right. They look for the youngest and the weakest. The weakest, yeah. And the second is that they separate him from the pack. So you find people who are separate from the pack, they are likely to be eaten. <laughs> and if they can separate from the pack, then the whole pride of lion will run him until they catch him. And they have a strategy. Have you watched a strategy? I'm thinking, these lions are acting like people. Sometimes they're, smart, they're smarter than people. Because you've got two rush and run the, um, that um, animal, and then you have one or two more who goes on the left, on the, on the, on the right, and we call that what? Flanks. The flanking the beast. So if you run to the right and to the left, you can get caught. You gotta run straight. However, you got, you got two down the road waiting for him. <laughs> I'm thinking, these animals are smart. That means what? It ain't going to get away. I mean, it's amazing. Yes, sir, Dave. You were speaking of the amazing part of these animals. Mammals in the water, sharks. When they get ready to, we'll say, pounce on a whale, the 90-foot ones, they'll come in a group of about 10. Mm -hmm. They'll flank off three to the side, three to the other side, and then two will go further out and come up from behind it, the other two's coming in. Yeah. They got a good plan, and I was like, wow, how are they communicating mm -hmm. to do this? Mm -hmm. I watched this on mm -hmm. TV mm -hmm. years ago when I had my physical vision. And I was watching this, and I was like, how are they knowing what to do? I mean, how are they communicating? Because I watched what they did, and it was a military precision to me. Yeah, it's amazing. It's always amazing. They come, and believe it, don't, don't even have a strategy in staying together and staying alive. Sometimes we don't have a strategy. And that's why believers are notorious for what? Eating their young. If people don't measure up to what they think, they either go down and chow down on them. No. As a matter of fact, the scripture says at the beginning, the strong out of what? Bear the, you know what infirmities are? They're not as strong and as informed and as educated with the wisdom of God like you, you out of what? bear with them in that infirmity so that they can become strong. And he says what? And not to please yourself. That means we need to be doing that as believers. We are not to, you know, catch the young person and go, well then they don't know what I do with us. Go ahead and shoot them up. No, 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 no. We go, I'm just giving them the word. Yeah, but they are not ready for that word. You know, it's almost like trying to give a uh, a six months baby a piece of steak. When they haven't even grown any teeth, they, they don't have a digestive system to do that. You gotta first what? Cultivate. So there are two things that we need to learn as believers. We need to learn how to cultivate and learn how to follow up or maintain. Cultivate, follow up, and maintain. Yes. Um talking about commenting on what the um, sister Michelle, what's her last name? Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas was saying. Yeah, first question. Um, uh, make it clear about the tithing, I mean tithing, because some, I think, and I've heard people say this before, even when they're working and got good jobs, they say you can also tithe your time, and that's not a replacement for the actual physical right. tithing offering. Right, it's not a replacement, it's something that you are supposed to do. You're called upon by God to do. He says, we are a body, yes? Yes? Yes. Okay, so your right hand is not going to work tomorrow because it's Labor Day, right? Memorial Day. Because it's Memorial Day, right? It's not going to work, right? But can you still tie your time into the work? No, 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 we're a body, right? That means that if you decide to disconnect, guess what happened? You become atrophy. You drop and blow away. That's what Jesus says when he talks about the vine, when he talks about the tree. He says, if he doesn't 
He said, number one, we've got to prune it and throw it away and do all this type of stuff. Because it is supposed to be a vibrant, healthy, contributing factor of who we are. That's why people who work in the, who are, who are members of ministry, we need to participate. We need to participate. We need to give our time. Because you see, it's God we're giving it to when we're giving it to other people being edified, growing or developing. When we work with people, when we mentor them, when we help them, when we support them through this process, like you would a child who is young, you support and you help them through that infancy, through that, um, uh, what is it, uh, child years and adolescent years, we're helping them through this. What are we doing? We're helping them to become free from us. We need to do that. I do believe that that is a dereliction of duty of almost every church I know. It's just that some is worse than others. Remember now, God is the one who will judge this, but I have to make sure I tell you. <laughs> I gotta make sure I tell you. Because you see, sometimes we have time for everything else, but we don't have any time to give to the work of God. But let's say something comes down, or something um, not good has happened to you. You want everybody to rally around you. And if they don't, then you go, oh, nobody of the church would they care about me. This is the weirdest thing I see, and I could never, and I do not ever understand it, that believers are out, not well, not sick, and they don't call anybody, they don't tell anybody, and when no one goes by to see them or whatever because they don't know, they give the, the person or the church a bad name. But they say they don't do that when it comes to their doctor or their dentist or people like that. You don't, you have a tummy ache or whatever, you call your doctor, right? You go, doctor, the doctor said, well, then the next appointment I have is two weeks. He says, the doctor, I want to see you right now. You see, you have more respect for those people than the church of God, than the, than the body of Christ. More respect. I always, always remember now, I says, more respect for the body of Christ, but you see, you are part of the body. That means you end up, what, disrespecting yourself. James says what? Is any among you what? Sick. Sick. Let him yeah. wait for the elders of the church to call him. Let him call him. <laughs> Let him wait for them to call him, right? Is that what he says? No. He says what? Let him call. Let the sick person call the elders of the church. That's right. <laughs> you see, man, we're in such gross violation of so many things. Sometimes I wonder how I get through this because there's so many things we need to cover. And even if we cover things, there's so many things we're left uncovered. But I just not let it get to me. <laughs> because for instance, this sanctuary should be filled with people. Filled. Because I know what God gave me to give to you is not just to you, even though you're part of it. It's a lot of other people. So then, you could inadvertently allow other people to draw up on the vine and die because you failed to do your job. You should be drafting other people to hear this word. If it's blessing you, why don't you not want other people to be blessed? It's like a member of the church call you and says, I've been, you know, under this attack or I've been going through this, and they tell you, you don't tell anybody else, you keep it to yourself. What kind of thinking is that? You know, we call other folks to say, well, sister so-and-so call, or brother so-and-so call, and they're under attack, and need for us to get together as a group and let's intercede for this person's deliverance. Not just you, for only you know. So when I see the person, I go, where are you? They go, oh, I wasn't feeling well. Oh, I didn't know that. You mean you didn't know? Nobody told you no, but I called this person, but that person didn't tell anyone. I can relate that to you in natural life if you want me to. <coughs> your family and your children's school 
and they were out in the play in the playground playing. One tripped and fell and hit his teeth out. The principal or the guidance counselor called home, got the father and says, says, Father, this is what happened to your child. He goes, Oh, okay. But now the mother, he didn't try to relay the message. So now after school, the, the mother's wondering, what's keeping that child away from home? You know, they should have been here. And the father said, oh, oh, by the way, the guidance, the guidance teacher called and says, um, um, Timothy fell over in the playground, hit a rock, and his two front teeth is gone. And she goes, you didn't tell me? Is that your way you operate? Come on, is that your way you operate? The same thing is true. The same thing is true. You see, we're not thinking how this thing is going to affect us later on as well. And it will affect you. Another thing about it is, when you get into the habit of song, praying for each other, you may never have that neck pain. You may never have that, that, that leg cramp because you've been involved with praying for other people and in praying for other people, especially when you pray in the Holy Ghost, which I wanted to talk about that today, but then maybe we'll leave it to next time, praying in the Holy Ghost or um, receiving the Holy Ghost. When you start praying, yeah, you may be praying for that thing, but when you pray in the Holy Ghost because you know not what to pray for as you ought to, you are praying ahead of things that possibly could happen to you. But you don't notice what you're praying for. That means you never end up with that leg pain. Because what? In praying for this person, you also pray for yourself. And in praying for this person, you're praying for the body of Christ. So when you're praying for the body, the entire body is going to be healed because of this area. Because you see, healing usually goes to the weakest part of the body first. And you usually heal from the weakest part to the strongest. Did you get that? Did you get that? All right. Can we be done for the day? Can we put a pause on this? Pick it up next time? Did you learn anything today? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, I'm glad you came. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad I came. And I'm glad that you came too. Come on, tell them, I'm glad that you came too. <laughs> Amen. Come on, let's repeat after me, Father. Father. My